All right, welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast. I am your host, Cameron Tepetapai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. We are going to chew the fat on some big trade news and some Celtics news, some injury news. But in the second half of the podcast, we are going to hop into the Celtics Lab and welcome in a very special guest. I will intro them in full when we get there, but Mara Healy, who is running for governor of Massachusetts, is stopping by the podcast to talk about her hoops career, the Boston Celtics, and of course, a little bit of politics. Very exciting. But first, let's do the news. We have some news to talk about, some trades, some injuries, some Carmelo Anthony buzz that is not Cameron generated. And we're going to hop right to it. It looks as if Donovan Mitchell is headed to Cleveland which caught us by surprise Man. in exchange for, uh, with swaps, five first round picks, Lori Markinen and a few other players from the camps. But really and truly this is the headline is he is not headed to the Knicks. Um, Darius Garland just tweeted a little bit ago, 10 and Spida Donovan Mitchell tweeted the exclamation point emoji, Alex rapid reaction. How are you feeling? Um, it's a really interesting trade. So I think for Cleveland, it's pretty clear that they are trying to win and they are trying to win right now. I think that this is definitely a positive trade for them in terms of their regular season expectations for this year. I don't think there's any doubt about that. They're going to be a better team than they were last year. I think Mitchell adds a secondary scoring punch that can take some of the creation burden off of Darius Garland uh, and really diversify their offense. I am still a little bit concerned about their wing situation and about the defensive backcourt pairing of Mitchell and Garland, particularly in the playoffs against the elite teams of the Eastern Conference. But at least for night, right now and for the next couple of years, I don't think there's any debate that Cleveland got better with this trade. For the Utah Jazz, once again, trader Danny Ainge is making out like a bandit. Five first-round picks to accelerate the rebuild, now giving the Jazz, I believe, something like nine unprotected first-round picks, not including swaps between Gobert, the Gobert, Mitchell, and O'Neal trades, all of which have happened this year, which is insane. Um, and in addition to that, acquiring some interesting young players, Colin Sexton, who the Jazz have reportedly inked to a big $72 million extension. Uh, and I, I kind of like the uh, pick of O'Shea Agbaji, who was the Cleveland Cavaliers draft pick. He's also going to Utah in the deal. Seems like Ainge is doing the kind of classic Danny Ainge thing. When he's blowing up a team, he blows it up all the way, tries to get as many picks and take as many swings on young players as possible. Um, I think this is this trade is a home run for the Jazz in a lot of ways, given what they're trying to do. If they were trying to win basketball games, this would not be the best trade, but that's not their intentions. They are trying to lose and lose hard and recoup value over the course of the next couple of years. And for that, I think this is a pretty clear win. Just quickly, let me speak to Justin, but home run for Cleveland is, a, I mean, home run for Utah is it a home run for Cleveland. Um, I think that's a TBD. I think yeah. that it's a, it's a big swing and it's one that makes sense given their trajectory and where they're at. Uh, I think that the Mitchell Garland pairing is really intriguing and dynamic offensively. That's probably the best offensive backcourt in the Eastern conference right off the bat. Uh, okay, if not cool. very close to it. Um, um, let me, well, let me speak to Justin because Justin, yeah. you said you couldn't believe that Cleveland was in this at the end of the day. Yeah, I was actually talking with you guys uh, just as it happened because I had been listening to Windhorst and Bond Temps and all them talk about, uh, and I, think it's, I can't remember the name of their pod, um, but anyway. Collective. Not, yeah, thank you. That's not the important part. The important part was that they were basically saying that New York felt that they were really bargaining from a position of strength, which, uh, you know, knowing Danny Ainge, I doubted. So I went looking on the trade machine to see if there were any realistic other deals out there that could, you know, pop up. And I did check Cleveland and I just ne neglected to believe that Lori Marconin is going to be young enough for rebuilding Utah. But then again, you could also, you know, flip him for, for assets later on down the road as well. So I didn't really think it through enough, but I'm actually pretty surprised to see that this actually happened. Yeah. Uh, Cleveland reportedly was in it for a little bit. Um, and I think the assumption was that was Utah trying to, conjure up a market out of New York. Um, I 
despite our presenting sponsor, I'm not a betting man. I actually thought about putting action on the Knicks landing Mitchell. I felt like that was the consensus. So this feels very surprising. Um, and the Colin Sexton thing, I said this on Twitter, Utah hosts a all-star game this year. I feel like that dude is guaranteed to be a token all-star. No offense intended. So pretty good deal for him. It didn't seem like he was going to end up in Cleveland one way or the other. Um, maybe the two sides were in agreement there and they were just waiting to, to offer the right sign and trade. Um, so really outstanding stuff. If Sexton is down with the cause, I mean, he opted into this deal. It seems like. The, the, the general sense that I got from the way things unfolded was when he, the, he basically, there's been a lot of speculation that the Sexton deal, the Colin Sexton hasn't been finalized because of some kind of internal thing. And I'm wondering now that if this was actually something that they had agreed to, like just hold off, we'll sign and trade you there. If that doesn't end up going through with New York, we'll see who wins this bidding battle here. And once they went and uh, extended, um, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. R.J. Barrett. Thank you. Um, R.J. Barrett, uh, that Ainge turned around and said, okay, play that way. No problem. I've got, a, I've got something right here. He thought I was kidding, and he called their bluff. And now the Knicks are going to be a very interesting team in the way they are usually an interesting team. Man, the Knicks are in a tough spot right now. They definitely wanted to get Mitchell, and, you know, I think – the implications of them getting Mitchell would be beyond simply acquiring him. That would, the plan I assume was to set the Knicks up as a long-term desirable free agent destination by having some locked in all-star talent there for a little bit. But um, you know, for the Knicks, I think this probably means another two years of just being in the wilderness. And I say two years because I think there's another interesting wrinkle to this trade that we really have to consider, which is that Mitchell has two years left on his deal. Um, given how close it appeared he was to going to the Knicks and how much by all accounts he wanted to do that. I think we're going to be coming back to Donovan Mitchell pretty soon as an interesting story uh, and where he might wind up. I don't think it's a guarantee that he stays in Cleveland long-term. This strikes they, they need me to win this year. Basically. Yeah. This strikes me as a, as a situation, exactly that Justin, where the Cavs need to be good immediately and in a sustained period for the next two years, they are now on the clock as far as retaining Mitchell goes. So let's, let's do that. Um, I'm putting you two on the spot a little bit, but with the assumption that Donovan Mitchell had eyes for Miami and New York, now he's in Cleveland, not quite the same with respect to the land. Where do you see Cleveland in the pecking order of the East? Um, I'm putting this in your lap unannounced, so I'll stall by giving you my gentle first thoughts. Uh, it's the Celtics and Bucks, I think, in their own little strata with respectfully Miami, probably Philly, and the Nets right there as well. Um, but man, a lot of defense by the rim and a lot of offense on the perimeter. It's a cool Cleveland team. Um, Kevin Love and Ricky Rubio, if R Rubio's healthy, they got some crafty vets. In the same way that and in any given year, the Hawks or the Blazers or whomever can just uh, Cinderella their way into the conference finals. Cleveland's not a jump change. I, I think Cleveland, I would be shocked if they represent the East in the finals, but goodness gracious, that's fun. Um, that's super fun. So Dr. Quinn, I hope I stalled enough, although those were yeah, yeah. authentic <laughs> thoughts. Uh, where do you see the Cavs in the East and um, with the purview that they got to do well to keep Mitchell's attention? Somewhere in the range of the Miami Heat and the Brooklyn Nets. So above the play-in, but not really a contender. They could end up as far as the conference finals, I think, as you suggested, but that, that doesn't sound too crazy to me, depending on how things break, depending on how people's health stands up uh, on a number of teams that might be above them in the standings. I think they are going to be a lot better than some people assume, but they are not, in my opinion, quite contenders yet. They still need to add at least one other piece. Yeah, I'm, lar I'm largely in agreement with you, Justin. I think they're going to be anywhere from four to six in the East. Um, I think they're better than a play-in team, so I have them going. I don't think they would go any lower than the sixth seed at this point. Um, in my mind, they're not better than Boston, Milwaukee, or Philly as currently constructed. I really like the Sixers heading into this year for whatever that's worth. Um, 
I think that they have the potential to crack a top three seed if Philly falters a little bit and maybe they kind of find a wing that can support that team a little bit more and play more of a blend of offense into defense, guard the best player on the perimeter, et cetera, et cetera. But without addressing their wing situation um, or bringing in a true defensive stud to um, play off the ball in the backcourt, I think their ceiling is probably a four seed, a tough out in the playoffs, but still a four seed in my mind. Yeah, you got to figure between Miami, Boston, Milwaukee, Philly, Toronto, Chicago, Brooklyn, Atlanta, and Cleveland. Three of those teams are going to be the play-in. Um, yeah. we, spent, we spent a decade poking fun at the East, and maybe the best teams still reside in the West, but this is, this is a fun Eastern Conference. I'm pretty pumped about that. It's going to be a real war. I mean, I think that you can argue that the top end teams in the West are maybe at a higher level, maybe, but the depth of the Eastern conference, I think makes it clearly the superior conference heading into this season. Cool. Uh, I will throw a little bit of cold water on all this and say Donovan Mitchell's defense does not inspire me. Um, so now Cleveland has a, a bit of a hole where they didn't as much before, but they got Mobley, uh, and they've got Jared Allen to pick up the pieces. So, man, good job, Cleveland. Uh, just remarkable for a team, mid-market, not a sexy market, really great team building. I'm very impressed, very happy to have parity in the league. Yeah, you know, this is the kind of move that a team like Cleveland has to make in a lot of ways. They're not a free agent destination. They have young talent that they need to retain. And, you know, they've locked in Darius Garland. Presumably they'll reach an extension with Evan Mobley unless things go horribly wrong. But this is the kind of move that um, they should make. And it, it's risky, it, as are any big trades for a superstar. There is definitely a chance that Mitchell could leave. But um, even in spite of that, I feel like this is an appropriate risk to take given their development. And I'm really excited to see what it looks like on the floor. Okay. Anyone who's listening to this pod, I'm sure, knows that Danilo Gallinari suffered uh, an injury playing in Eurobasket. What do you think of bringing Carmelo Anthony to Boston? So here's the deal. Um, with Gallinari healthy, I was, as you all know, as the listeners know, as everybody knows, not particularly enthralled by the idea of signing Mello. I think the weaknesses in his game are pretty apparent and have been for a while now. He's a high volume shooter who needs the ball in his hands to be effective. Uh, he has not played defense in my estimation for about four years, something like that. And, uh, I'm concerned about just how he would affect the general game flow for the Boston Celtics. That being said, Gallinari has a lot of those issues himself. I was more enthusiastic about Gallo because he's a better corner three-point shooter and he seems to have a better sense of his role in the offense. If push comes to shove right now, the Boston Celtics sign Carmelo Anthony today as a temporary Gallo replacement. I don't think I'll be too upset if the Boston Celtics are relying on Carmelo Anthony to play heavy minutes in, say, a playoff run. I will not be thrilled about that. So that is where I stand for the regular season as a temporary Gallo replacement. If it needs to be Carmelo Anthony, I suppose it can be Carmelo Anthony. One thing I have to add to that is my concerns also deal with chemistry and him knowing his role. He does look like he knows his role now, right? But he's also been on teams with like Damian Lillard, LeBron James, people who he, he truly considers his peers. I don't know that he necessarily looks at the Jays in the same way. So I do feel that there is some potential for some hurt feelings. Uh, some other of our peers on the CLNS network have pointed out that he could just be cut on the minimum contract if that did, mm -hmm. you know, come up which you know is a reasonable argument um i don't know how that would be overall for the team vibes but if that was happening in the first place probably something bad beyond that is also happening right uh so you know as long as everyone's winning i think everyone's going to be happy with the role so i don't think i would be too upset about it given the circumstances i think it's great i think it's fun good vibes veteran leadership i don't think Mello has any pretense that he ought to be starting at this point um, I said this on Twitter, he's, he and Jalen can talk about fashion. Um, Jalen Brown's 
celebration game, I think he could opt the ante. He didn't really lean into the blowing the kiss thing the way I wanted him to. Melo can help him with that. And who knows? Dominican team in the league as well. Wow. Okay. Do you know that for a fact or is that a guess? I'm, I'm pretty sure Carmelo Anthony is Dominican. I think the only other... No, I mean just that there aren't other teams with more Dominican. Well, Duarte is on the Pacers and Cat is on the Timberwolves, so I don't know if there are any other ones. There might be, but I don't know of them, so... All right. Well, we'll, we'll follow up with that one. Okay. Um, we do talk about Bruno on this podcast. <laughs> the Celtics, since we last talked, signed Bruno... Uh, Capagolo. I hope I said that right. Probably not. No, that's that's what you call uh, Capagolo. You're, you're doing the Sopranos impersonations. Caboclo. Caboclo. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's okay. I have an, I have an uncle who's Sicilian. Um, anyways, they signed Bruno to an unguaranteed one-year deal for about two and a half million dollars. Sort of adding a little volume to the race for backup center in Boston, the most important sports news in the city right now. Um, Justin, just because you're following the beat a little more closely, anything about Bruno the average fans might miss? Well, the thing that Bruno used to miss were three-pointers, right? He was not a good three-point shooter. Overseas in, for I think, the Moges of the uh, Pro A French League, he was shooting at like four, almost five a game uh, at a clip of like 44%, which is absurdly good. It's not going to be as good anywhere near as good in the NBA, but I mean, if he can hit league average, he's a keeper. Take it, Alex, anything? Not a ton to add. You know, he's got long arms, which is good. Um, ultimately, I, I kind of don't think he's super likely to make the opening day roster. I think he's probably going to be kicking around in Maine a lot, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with Grant Williams and Jason Tatum playing a lot of the four. So that third or fourth center for me is not hyper important. But whatever. Nah, we, we covered that in the previous episode. Okay, a couple more things in the interest of news, and then we will get uh, to that aforementioned conversation with Mara Healy. Jalen Brown started a partnership with LegalZoom to help women entrepreneurs around the country. Dr. Quinn, can you fill us in on that? Uh, there. Okay, so the way that the article framed it that, that Jalen cited There has been a surge in people working from home, starting their own business to do a variety of things. And the money, uh, historically speaking, when you see the numbers of the funding that's available for these kinds of entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. it's just absurdly weighted in favor of men. It's like 4% of traditional funding and 2% of venture capital goes to women. I could have it backwards, but either way, it's both a disgusting number, right? So he's trying to step up and kind of like fill the gap a bit. Clearly, he's not going to be even close to enough, but, you know, someone's got to start somewhere, so. Yep, Uh, that's our Jalen. It's great when NBA players, you know, use their platform and their money to do good, but I'm just always impressed with how Jalen hones in on really pertinent issues. Um, So good job out of you, Jalen, of course. A couple other things in the interest of news, the NBA COVID protocols have changed. If you are unvaccinated, you will be tested weekly. If you are vaccinated, you will be tested if you are symptomatic. There is not any sort of mask requirement. And I personally, I'll take the lead on this one. I understand where the NBA is coming from. I can tell you as a history teacher that almost without fail, after two years of any pandemic, societies basically give up and they just ride it out. That doesn't mean it's ethically correct or morally correct or even pragmatically correct. But I understand that big institutions in this country either are done or are done selling, doing the right thing. I personally suspect I'm gonna wear my mask a little bit in the fall, certainly in the winter, Um, but it does look like the NBA is doing away with most COVID policies, except it doesn't look like Canada is changing its rules. So we will get to play hey, is that player vaccinated or are they actually injured at least a few times this season? How fun is that? Um, My favorite game. I just want to add... It, yeah, we're getting good at it. <laughs> it, 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 it. Guys, it's not hard to say if the case count in the market gets above a certain level, we will have the players wear masks. It's not even a particularly egregious sacrifice. I know they have to, you know, negotiate these things with the players union, but come on, just wear some goddamn masks when the case levels are above 
an egregiously high number, which is happening in parts of the United States right now. So that's all. I, that's the only thing that I would ask of this this plan. No one cares what I think. They're not probably going to do it until it's too late. But I digress. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it looks like the Omicron BA.5 specific booster will be made available pretty soon. So uh, go ahead and get yourself one of those. Anyways, a couple other bits and pieces of news. I don't think we'll dwell on it. We'll just report it and move on. Um, Montrose Harrell had a uh, what was once, I think, a felony marijuana Seriously, charge like a downgraded yeah. to a uh, misdemeanor. First of all, uh, we weren't, even though we're interviewing Mara Healy, we weren't going to get political on this podcast, but here we go. Thank goodness that even that it's a misdemeanor is pretty ridiculous in this day and age, but that it was about to be a felony. Uh, draw your own parallels to what's going on with Brittany Griner and on and on and on, because that is so, so, so ridiculous. And Montrez Harrell, congratulations on that. That must have been scary and unfair. We have in our notes, we could talk about it. Would it make sense to sign Montrose Harrell? Um, either of you want to make the case yes? I would be down to sign Montrez Harrell. I don't think that he's going to want to take what the Celtics have available to offer. They can't yeah. really give him a whole lot of money or a particularly massive role. He, if he signs here, it would be almost exclusively for the chance to win a title. And I get the sense that Montrez is just not quite at that phase in his career where he's going to be chasing rings. But hey, if he wants to come play for the Celtics for close to the minimum, I'm down. He probably wants to spend at least a season at another team that could at least give him a mid-level so he doesn't end up in the Dennis Schroeder kind of a situation where he's still good enough to play, but people are always saying, well, why did he take the minimum? Why is he taking, you know, like even a mid-level, I think, might be kind of harmful to him, but he doesn't really have too much of a choice at this point. Um, I do agree that if he did come here, he wouldn't see more than maybe 20 minutes a night, which is probably not enough for him to rebuild his value. Yeah, I, I, rangy and athletic, but like I don't know that he fits the defensive archetype for you. Yeah, that was, I was being generous. He doesn't at all. Okay, we got uh, somehow Carmelo Anthony does. Sorry, I have to get that in there. <laughs> yeah, Melo's earned it. Trez has it. Okay. <laughs> um, and then just finally, I don't really want to dwell on it. In this medical fraud case that has a number of NBA alums wrapped up, Terrence Williams has pled guilty. And Glenn Big Baby Davis of Boston Celtics fame claims he never got the money, so he's claiming he's innocent. It's a weird kind of NBA. That's not a defense, man. I robbed the bank, but they didn't give me the money, so I'm innocent. We'll God see bless. I hope it works. I really do. I hope it works. Sure. We'll see what happens there. So that's it for the news. Uh, what we're going to do now is hop right into the Celtics lab, and with the magic of editing, Welcome in Mara Healy, the current Attorney General of the state of Massachusetts and a gubernatorial hopeful. Uh, we'll talk to Mara on the other side of our break. Okay, let's hop into the lab portion of the programming and we welcome in a very special guest, the former co-captain of the Harvard women's basketball team, the starting point guard of UBBC Worcester, not Salzburg, and perhaps the next governor of the state of Massachusetts, Mara Healy, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Good to see you. Uh, we're very excited to talk to you. We're going to talk to you predominantly about hoops and a little bit of politics at the end. So right away, you, um, as part of your campaign, you have something called the Healy Hoops Tour. Can you tell us about what that is and where that idea came from? Yeah, well, um, I am a basketball player, um, sort of a has been, but I still love the game. I love to play. And I find that basketball is just a great way to connect with people. And during my time as attorney general, I have supported a lot of youth basketball. I've played basketball with kids and, and I continue to as I run for governor, because as I say, I think it's a great way to connect with people. It's about teamwork, too. And one of the things as a point guard, you know, I'm trying to bring to this campaign is my idea of governing is really about working together, collaboration, right? And the greatest stat for a point guard is the assist. And that's really how I, I view my role as, as governor or somebody who wants to be governor. It's, it's, it's that kind of teamwork and really getting the best out of everybody. Wow, that's, <laughs> Sorry, I love just, that. Yeah, 
That, that, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned being a point guard because to that end, I actually just saw on my Twitter feed a clip of you from 2016 in a pickup game throwing a pretty absurd no look pass to a wide open shooter. That's definitely a better pass than any pass I've ever thrown in my life. So great job on that. Um, just really quickly, how did you kind of first get into basketball? Well, I grew up I'm the oldest of five kids and, you know, I grew up and my mom, I think, you know, was raising us for a long number of years on her own. My parents split up when I was about 10. And I remember um, that one of the things she did is, is she got us out playing sports and it was great for us to to be busy and occupied with things. And I just really took to all sports, but especially basketball. I think, you know, I remember uh, being as er as young as two or three years old. I always wanted a ball in my hand. It was like my favorite thing to do with anyone, an adult or an older kid was to play catch, whether it was a football or baseball, it didn't matter. Um, and I tried to play as much as I could as a girl growing up. Of course, I was mostly playing with boys, you know, played little league up until eighth grade and and played all the sports. Um, but basketball was just a game I was really, really passionate about and into from an early Early age. It's interesting that you mentioned, you know, playing mostly with boys uh, as a girl growing up. So to that end, um, one thing that's happening this year, the WNBA is in the midst of its most viewed playoffs ever. Speaking as, you know, from some experience as a woman in hoops, how has the women's pro game changed recently? And what do you think explains the surge in viewership? Well, it's been so exciting to see this. I mean, basically bigger, faster, stronger. I mean, the skills are are really, really evolved from the time that, that I grew up. I graduated college in 92. I played in Europe until 95. And I just think about, I mean, that was before the ABL, it was before the WNBA. So that's what women would go do. We'd go, we'd go over and play in Europe. Watching these women on TV, uh, it's just phenomenal. It's so, so exciting. And I think you know, it's also the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And so you see, you know, the effect of Title IX is more women and girls were able to play sports. Obviously, their skills got better. And so now, you know, I think it's really cool when little boys are wearing Sue Bird t-shirts, right? I mean, that that's a great place for us to be. For sure. Thank you. So, Mara, uh, that's uh, Alex, good friend of mine. Both of us graduates of Tufts, for whatever that's worth. Um, also <laughs> high school history teacher. I'm going to see you too. <laughs> hey, great program too. Carla Barubi now down at, at Princeton, but coached the women's program there for a long time and, and uh, did a great job. Oh yeah. Go Jumbos. All right. Um, Dr. Quinn's going to talk to you about the Celtics um, and your relationship with that team. So I'm a native of Connecticut, big UConn Huskies fan. So it's great to hear all these UConn Huskies names floating around. Uh, but as I understand it, you were a Celtics fan growing up in war number 14 for Bob Cousy. Uh, what about him inspired you to do that? All right. So I'm a, I'm a kid growing up in, in a small town in New Hampshire, by by Hampton beach actually. And I think, you know, I learned to read actually reading the sports pages. I used to read Bob Ryan, you know, as a, as a kid growing up. And, um, I always, you know, because I started playing basketball, I of course wanted to wear the number of my favorite team, the Celtics. I was a point guard. Um, because basically if you're like, five, six, seven years old and you can dribble, then you're automatically the point guard, right? Because who can dribble? <laughs> and so I want to wear the number of like the greatest point guard in Celtics history. And of course that was Bob Cousy. I started wearing 14 in third grade and wore it all the way through my, my pro career. And then um, actually came to know Bob over the years and he's become a dear friend and, and a wonderful, wonderful person to, to hang out with and spend time with. But that's that's what happened um, as as I just chose this number. And somebody asked me about my number. I was running in 2014 for attorney general and we had like shirts made up with Healy, Team Healy, 14, my number. It also was the year. And somebody asked me why I chose that number. And I told the story of Bob Cousy and then got a call and had an opportunity to go out and visit with him in Worcester. And I've had a lot of visits since. Very cool. So. I have a question related to another teammate of his. Uh, in terms of, you know, you, you were talking about politics and the assist, and there was a long time uh, 
shall we say, rivalry between Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain. Uh, and Bill came out on top because of, you know, his concern for the team aspect of basketball. But he had a concern that, you know, far exceeded uh that you know sport itself to society more generally that we also see in Jalen Brown today so I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about having players like Jalen Brown and Bill Russell connected to the Celtics and what it might mean for you personally yeah I mean I I think it's it's really I, I love to see when our sports heroes just assume that platform, assume the role, you know, whether you like it or not, a lot of people are looking at you, looking up to you. And, you know, I look at both Jalen Brown and at Bill Russell as people who were role models off the court as well. And, you know, certainly when you look at, at Bill Russell and what he did, not just to change the game, because this was a guy who literally revolutionized the game, you know, by his vertical and his shot blocking, but what he did off the court in terms of blazing a trail for racial equity and justice, you know, standing up to some real indignities was really something. And similarly, Jalen Brown, you know, not being afraid to speak out for justice, for equality, it matters. I also give a shout out to, to the women in the WNBA who, you know, took that on um, as well. And so, you know, I, um, I think it really matters. And I really, I, I really applaud the athletes who were, you know, not not just willing to play the game, but who are willing to sort of walk the walk, too. And I think it's a great point you make about the difference between a, a Chamberlain and a Russell, you know. And, and one of the things I love about basketball is, you know, it's it's not one against five. I mean, sometimes it feels that way. But the great teams, that's not how you win. Right. And, you know, I will take the better team any day over, you know, over any all-star. Um, and, and, and I think that's a recipe for success in government and politics and life teamwork. How do we make each other? How do we make each other better? Very cool. I know Cam has a lot of really important stuff. We're getting a little political now. So if this isn't your thing, you know what to do, but I hope it is. So Cam, go ahead. Sure. So uh, Mara, a few more questions, but these are a little more uh, your purview, but as Justin said, for listeners who are, you know, the sports is their escape. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you later. Um, I'm going to make a connection to the Celtics. Actually, Celtics assistant general manager Mike Zarin was a huge advocate for ranked choice voting when it was on the docket here in Massachusetts. And I, I know that you were a supporter, too. I'll tip my hand and say I was as well. Um, I know that it didn't pass here, but it, it's in the news because of what just happened in Alaska. Um, can I just get your quick thoughts on ranked choice voting and maybe if it has a future in Massachusetts? Yeah, I, I support it. I mean, I think it is about opening up democracy in a day and age where too many people are turned off by government, right? Whether it's the noise they see on TV or the constant fighting or, you know, things not seeming to get done. I understand why people are tuned off. And and ranked choice voting, I think, is, is a way that more people can get involved and actually see, you know, democracy in action, see their vote count. And so, um, you know, that's where I, I am on that issue. Sure. And OK, but let's get a little more pressing here. Um, speaking of people a little frustrated with the government, the MBTA has been in the news. Um, I just love your thoughts on where we're at with that. And uh, another forward facing question. What's the future of the MBTA? Well, boy, um, you know, this is something decades in the making in terms of problems. And, you know, we have big time got to deal with this. We are not going to have a functioning economy if we don't have a good public transit system. And, you know, that includes the ability to to get into and, and out of um, our, our stadiums, our, our ball fields, the garden and the like, our concert halls. I mean, you know, sports, culture, arts, these things drive, right? they're huge economic engines and, and people come by the tens of thousands. They've got to have a way to get there. The people who work there need to be able to get there. And so a few things, we can't be doing enough um, or quickly enough when it comes to the T. I have um, called on the administration to do everything that it can right now. We've got money coming in that we've got to use to invest in infrastructure, invest in the personnel, but this thing has got to get fixed and right away. Um, I know it's hard right now with the orange line being closed. Hopefully, you know, that puts the state on a better path in, in a shorter amount of time, but we're just not going to be where we need to be. And, you know, 
I begin, the, the reason I'm running for governor is because I believe so much in the state. I mean, not only do we have the best sports teams, right, and the greatest sports mm-hmm. history, but we have uh, incredible resources, human capital, intellectual capital, business, research, innovation, know-how. But for us to be competitive and remain competitive, we got to get after it. And absolutely, you know, reducing costs around housing, reducing costs around childcare, and fixing our transportation system to make it safe and affordable is job one. Tremendous. I, I teach economics at Lexington High School. I might quote you verbatim when we talk about infrastructure. Okay, uh, a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Thanks for yeah. the work with you, by the way. It's great. My um, my stepdad was a teacher and a coach, and my mom's still a school nurse. So shout out to all of you working with our young people. Well, well first of all, thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, and a perfect segue, I was going to ask, what is the state of schooling in the state of Massachusetts? And again, broadly, what do you think is the future of schooling in Massachusetts? Well, you know, here it's about investment. And I'll tell you a few things, right? Massachusetts is home to the first public school in the country, the first public library. So not only do we like own, you know, and, and we're title town, but we also have this incredible history when it comes to public education. But we got to take care of that. And right now we have too many people, too many young people, especially as I look at the city of Austin, who don't have the same educational experience that other kids around the state are having. That's absolutely unacceptable. I want every child in every school to have access to quality education. How do you get there? Well, you've got to invest in it. You know, you've got to hold people accountable. You've got to provide the training. You've got to provide the support. One thing that I think a lot of students need right now is access to better mental health services. I mean, through COVID, and I talk about this a lot, you know, our students aren't gonna succeed if their mental health needs aren't taken care of. And I want to recruit and put an army of mental health professionals in place in all of our schools around the Commonwealth, because I know even, you know, even if you're a more affluent school district or a less affluent school district, there are profound mental health needs right now facing our students. Parents are struggling with this, educators are. So, you know, that's one area I really want to invest in as governor. Tremendous. Um, and one last political question, and then we'll close with a Celtics prediction. What's most exciting to you about this gubernatorial race and the prospect of becoming governor? Um, what what really tickles your fancy? What's What makes you dream big dreams? What are you most excited about? Well, um, I... I want to be there for Banner 18. Um, <laughs> no, you know, uh, kidding, but not kidding. I, um, I think, it, I think it's this idea about harnessing right our resources. I mean, as with any team, it's like we've got these incredible components here in our state. I mentioned some of them: our people, our businesses, our our research, our, our innovation, our history, and. You know, in this time where people are hurting um, and there are some real issues we've got to deal with as as a state, as a country, as a world. I want to be a governor who's about leading people together, bringing people together to get things done, to move us forward. And I believe in this state like no other state in the country. We are the best state in the country because I've seen the country. I've talked to and worked with other officials from around the country. I know it to be true. So that's what excites me most. The, the the potential that's out there, you know, with the right leadership, bringing people together. And that's what I'm going to try to do as a washed up point guard. <laughs> well, uh, you are, your words, not mine, a washed up point guard, a very accomplished attorney general. And like I said, perhaps the next governor of the state of Massachusetts. So uh, Mara Healy, next time I see you, maybe I'll have to call you Governor Healy. But in closing, what is your prediction for the Boston Celtics this season? You know, I think they learned a lot through that playoff run. Love, um, love coach, uh, love the team, love the way, you know, getting them to play hard, play together. I think there were a lot of kinks that that had to get worked out. Almost got there. And I'm really, really excited, even though, you know, we've got a couple injuries. Um, I'm really excited about what's possible and what they can do. And, you know, another thing is I am grateful to the Celtics because if it weren't for Red Auerbach and Bob Cousy going to Europe, after World War II, part of the Marshall Plan, building out all those gyms, right? Creating a market for basketball worldwide. I would never have had the opportunity to go play as as a kid 
overseas and, you know, never would have had that experience opening up my world. I think it's made me a stronger leader. It gave me the courage um, to, to run for office and to pursue things. So, you know, not to, not to, to, to almost a come full circle here. I just, I just wanted to give a nod um, to, to that bit of Celtics history and, you know, how much I, um, I, I carry that with me in my, um, in my fandom, of course, uh, but, but just appreciation for the team. So I'll be rooting. That makes four of us. Uh, I know I speak for Alex and Justin when I say thank you so, so much for your time. And we wish you all the luck in the world with your candidacy and go Celtics. All right. Go Celts. Take it easy, guys. Thanks thank very, you. very much.